one of the reasons why I'm excited that your book has caught has kind of caught on is for exactly this reason. It's not just about Kamala Harris. It's about a much deeper analysis of politics and the class forces behind and all those interests. But um, I did just want to ask you in general about anti-imperialism. Why has anti-imperialism historically been such a core component of class politics? And what is the difference between being anti-war and being anti-imperialist? Well, my understanding is that imperialism refers to a system. Uh, capitalism in its monopolistic stage. And it's very interesting because that is the classical Marxist-Leninist understanding, right? Lenin talks about imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. And what really defines imperialism is holding back economic development. It's preventing countries from being able to take control of their own economy and resources, and instead having what he calls the export of capital, where instead of, you know, it used to be we exported tires or we exported uh, cars. Now we export the corporation, right? McDonald's is spread all over the world. We don't export French fries we export McDonald's, right? And it's about the export of capital and preventing countries from developing their own uh, industries and keeping countries in poverty, holding back economic development. Now, that was the, you know, the understanding that the, the Bolsheviks and the Soviet Union had. And that's why uh, right after the Bolsheviks took power, they gave military support to the Emir of Afghanistan. Uh, and he was a conservative monarchist, but he was fighting the British Empire. And they said, that works for us. And they convened the Congress of the Peoples of the East in Baku. And they said, hey, if you're going to fight the British Empire, we're with you because imperialism is the enemy. Um, and uh, that, and when you talk about being a component of class politics, you can even go back to Marx, right? In Marx's day, Ireland was fighting for its independence. And Karl Marx, he, he wrote a very important letter where he said the duty of, of working class radicals and, and Marxists and socialists in, in Britain is to support the Irish freedom struggle everywhere and to get the English workers to see the victory of the Irish people against the British Empire, not as a question of abstract justice, but as a matter of their own liberation, right? The, I think uh, A.J. Musty, who was a, a kind of a Christian socialist pacifist, he would say our real enemy is at home. And that is what anti-imperialism is. It's the understanding that these countries around the world that are struggling against the domination of big banks and corporations from the West are our allies in the struggle against the big corporations here. Right. And that, that ultimately, you know, uh, we don't have an interest in helping, you know, ExxonMobil, BP and Bank of America take over the world. And in fact, we're getting screwed by Bank of America and ExxonMobil right here. And so we have a common interest with people around the world that are struggling against them. Now, that was the classical Marxist Leninist understanding. But I've been to Iran where they are definitely not Marxists. They are very religious. But, you know, they study Lenin in Iran and they study the economics of imperialism. And, you know, Khomeini, the founder of the Islamic Republic, he talked about American economic imperialism. Uh, and the Bolivarian countries, they are socialists, uh, but they, are, they incorporate Roman Catholicism, indigenous ideology. They have this understanding. Um, and, you know, you go around the world today. Uh, the classic Soviet style Marxism is not really in fashion anymore. But this understanding of what imperialism is and that, that it's a system, that, that is very much the global understanding. And I do maintain that understanding. I'm at the point where, you know, it's funny, I wrote this book four years ago. I don't call myself a communist as much now because, I mean, I know what I believe. My beliefs haven't changed. But if you say communist now, people think you're woke. And I'm not. I'm not woke. And I've been to communist right. countries. They right. are not woke. But if I tell, it used to be in America, if I told people I was a communist, they would say, how could you be that? And I could say, well, let me tell you all about it. Nowadays, if I tell people I'm a communist, they go, oh, I know what you are. You're uh, you're 17. You have purple hair and you think all Republicans are Nazis and you're obsessed with the trans thing. That ain't me. That's not what I believe. And it ain't what they believe in in Venezuela. It's not what they believe in in Vietnam. It's not what they believe in China. It's not what the countries around the world struggling against imperialism believe. So the term that I've started to use to describe myself, I say that I am an innovationist, because if you look at the world, right, the the underlying question, and this is what that last 10 pages that you didn't get to, Russell, are about, is that human <laughs> beings- That's what I said, the reveal. Yeah, human <laughs> beings are creative creatures. We are constantly reinventing our relationship with our environment. And human technology, uh, we, we're constantly moving to a higher plane. Ants have been building their ant farms the same way for thousands of years. Beavers have been making their beaver dams the same way for thousands of years. But in just seven or 8,000 years, We've gone from hunter-gatherers in the woods to space travel, to iPhones, to artificial intelligence. We constantly reinvent our relationship 
with Mother Nature to make it serve us in a more efficient way, to expand our population, to increase our life expectancy, to make life more comfortable. That is the nature of what it means to be a human being as we're constantly trying to expand. And right now we are in a crisis because human brilliance has outstripped the narrow horizons, the narrow limits of production organized for profit. And what we need is a rationally organized economy so we can keep inventing, keep expanding, keep having our life expectancy grow, keep expanding our population. Well, taking it back to that Eastern establishment, the Rockefellers, the DuPonts, the British Empire, they say that the solution right now is that we have to degrow. We have to reduce consumption because the problem is that there's too many people. They are not Marxists. They are Malthusians, right? They mm -hmm. want, they blame the, the economic crisis that we're in in the world on overpopulation and that their solution to save the global economic system and conveniently let them stay at the top of it is to prevent growth around the world. And they see anti-imperialist countries, countries that have broken out of their system as the main target because what are they doing? They're growing. They're, that's what they do. When countries break out of Western domination and imperialism, they start growing and building and electrifying and wiping out illiteracy and, and bringing their people up. And that is seen as a threat to the environment. And Biden openly said so when he was running for president. If you read his essay, America Must Lead Again, he said, we're going to stop China from building power plants in Africa. Right? That's what they want. To save their system, they want degrowth. And that is what fascism is. And that is what fascism has always been. Fascism is not an aesthetic. Fascism is not being racist. People have been racist before. People have been militaristic and authoritarian before. Fascism is when, in a long-term economic crisis, the government kind of locks down society and forcibly degrows, right? They created a slave labor underclass in Nazi Germany. They, they forced women out of the workforce to get rid of unemployment. They rebooted the economy by creating, you know, lots of military spending, uh, you know, fascist economics is trying to save the capitalist system with forcible, heavy handed degrowth. And I must say, you know, I, I agree with a lot of what Trumper folks say, but they seem to think that this Malthusianism from the World Economic Forum and all of that is Marxism and communism. And I right. have the painful and difficult task of saying, well, actually, it's not. And if you go to any Marxist or communist country, that's clearly not the case. But that is what the woke people believe. And a lot of them think they're Marxists. So I can understand why you're confused, right? And I can understand why it's confusing. And also, let me add that socialism in our time and anti-imperialism, a really big part of it nowadays is small business owners, right? Vietnam, the way they've had their economic miracle is with uh, their, their, you know, enabling people to start their own businesses. They call it a socialist oriented market economy. Nicaragua, I've been there. I was an elections monitor there. They have a, a what they call a... Um, a micro entrepreneurship program where the government loans money to people to start their own businesses, worker cooperatives are. And that is the strength of their socialist economy in Nicaragua. And the 21st century socialism is all about enabling people to start their own business and be creative and all of that and subsidizing them and doing so in coordination with an overall planned economy. So the state is kind of making sure there's constantly growth. And then what is the ultimate goal is a world with so much growth and so much wealth that the need for a government can fade away, that people can just do what they feel like doing. Labor becomes life's prime want, meaning people work to entertain themselves, to get joy from being creative, not because it's a necessity. Uh, a, a society where there's so much wealth and abundance that there's really no need for anyone to hoard anything and everyone's pretty much equal because there's enough for everybody. That's the ultimate goal. And Marx talked about the higher stage of communism. He's talking of a world of vast wealth and vast abundance, right? And and so I tell people I'm an innovationist because I believe innovation is the essence of what I'm for. I believe in human beings and our creative power. And I believe that we can revolutionize our relationship with the environment and get to a higher plane. And, you know, I think that's what it means to be a socialist or a communist in our time. But that's not what it means to most people. So I, I now, you know, my organization is called the Center for Political Innovation. And I'm saying I'm an innovationist. Please clap. <laughs>